Hi, my name is Tomas Johnson. I'm a classical and jazz pianist based in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And today we're going to be talking about Scriabin's Harmonic Prophecies of Jazz. Before we get started, I want to set the table a little bit for the timeline. When Scriabin died far too soon in 1915, uh, jazz was not really a thing. Uh, it was around the tail end of the ragtime era, like this. That was ragtime, 1890s, 1900s, and by the mid-1910s, that started to fade away into uh, what we now call stride piano, which developed in the 20s, uh, and it goes like this. That's stride piano, and it was uh, characterized by a kind of a bouncy swing feel instead of straight, um, kind of dominant harmonies uh, that were altered with like flat nines, uh, sharp fives, and also kind of a, a light touch. Um, sometimes you start to get kind of um, flourishes like the these start to come in. And so, so basically Scriabin died before that was really a thing. And so he really missed um, the development of jazz. He, had he lived a few more years, he would have lived to see it, but he, he kind of missed it. And I say all that to mean that he deserves basically the lion's share of credit for the harmonic innovations we're gonna talk about, the ultra dominant voicings. We think now, oh, they're jazz inspired, but no, jazz was not really a thing at the time. So. We think that they're jazz inspired now because we associate them with jazz, but he really predicted them before they happened. Now, Rachmaninoff is another composer whose harmonies sound jazz inspired, but his actually are. Not only did he have Scriabin to rely on, but he also was a regular in New York City and he met the great pianist Art Tatum and they had a friendship. So he actually was overtly inspired by jazz. Not so for Scriabin, who, um, whose mind came up with these harmonies kind of independently of the American scene. I want to start off by talking about uh, Scriabin's Opus 2, Number 2, Prelude. Very early in his career, 1889. At this point, the altered dominant harmonies are not really present there. He does have some strange, unorthodox voicings. An open uh, major 7 is kind of a, a little bit strange. Um, he, he, he loves the, the 13 over the dominant 7th chord, and that kind of comes in later in jazz. But this is very simple harmonically. It's got a soaring melody, they're very lyrical. I could very easily imagine beautiful words being put to this on a lead sheet context. I'll show you what it sounds like. It's a lovely melody. As you can hear, Scriabin is very clear about four bar phrases and regular cadences, and these features make it kind of prime material for improvisation in jazz context. I'm gonna do kind of like a, a bebop inspired improvisation on this, and you'll hear what I mean.
So that was kind of a bebop influenced interpretation of that prelude. And part of the reason why that worked was because of his usage of the half diminished chord right here. That's kind of one of the ways that jazz uh, pianist might harmonize something like that. And his melodies have so much lyricism to them. There's a lot of contour. Uh, not scalar at all. And what makes that fun is as a jazz musician, one of the things we do when we improvise, we add kind of like chromatic clusters in between. And really all you have to do to adapt that melody to jazz context is one, add some swing, but also add some chromatic passing notes in between. So it comes very naturally. Now this, in the early era, there's less uh, similarities to jazz, but once we get into kind of some of his um, a little bit a little bit later preludes, his opus 11 preludes, number five has always stood out to me. I'm gonna play a little bit of that. Um, So the things that stand out to me there, um, a few things. One, the four bar phrases again. Um, a few things, other things stand out though. For example, uh, around halfway through the Konanima sequence. <laughs> With a little bit of swing, that becomes something that a stride pianist like Art Tatum might do. And I'll show you what that could look like in a jazz context. too. But the harmonies are very amenable to that kind of thing. Um, the wide spacings, the tenths, the leaps in the left hand, that kind of stuff is bread and butter for a jazz pianist. Um, one thing that you're going to notice is that really when I'm adapting uh, Scriabin's music for a jazz context, I'm really not changing much the harmonies because the harmonies are already kind of altered down the two fives like a jazz pianist might do. Really, the only change that needs to be made is a few chromatic extra pitches to the melodies, but primarily rhythm, a sense of strong, kind of a shuffling swing. But the harmonic essentials are already there. I want to scoot ahead to another example. This is a great example right here. Um, from... Uh, I'm going to just play one of his more so, Opus 45, number one, a few bars of it. It's 
Scooting ahead just a little bit, to a little bit later in there. lovely. One of the things that stands out to me is the way that he does chromatic descending inner voices. Uh, for example, in the I'm kind of chording through some of the melody there. Um, and what's going on is that each voice has a def definitive place to go. The voice setting is so tight. It's beautiful. And it's kind of similar to what a jazz pianist might do on a ballad. Um, like if I was going to take a, a song like Body and Soul, um, a thoughtful pianist would try to create inner chromatic lines, kind of like that. that Scraven uses, especially the flat nine and the sharp five, are very common for jazz pianists. Um, so that's another example. Um, I'm going to go through a few more here. Scraven's Sonata Number no. 3 has a gem of a third movement. I want to play the main theme for you. Um, notice the, the four bar phrases and also the wide um, kind of uh, voicings. Uh, that are very chromatic, very altered. I'm going to point out a few of them afterwards. Uh, they resemble, in my mind, a little bit some of the block chord voicings that jazz pianists would do later in the 50s. And I'll show you what I mean. So here is a piece of his third movement from Third Sonata. is really jazz inspired. It's a 251. But this chord right here, the minor major 7, is a very common chord in jazz ballads. You kind of think of it sometimes in film noir as well. You hear kind of a detective movie, like that kind of thing. But here's a kind of more somber tone. Um, and the voicings that Scraven uses here remind me a little bit, like I said, of the block chord voicings of someone like George Shearing or Oscar Peterson. And what they would do is they would use diminished harmonies um, and major seven chords to kind of create tight um, voice leading within an octave. So they could go up a scale like this. It was like this, if they want to do a melody. And there's a little bit of that going on in Scraven's right hand. Um, it would take very little adaptation 
to create kind of a George Shearing inspired um, version of this movement. very direct. Um, but it's, it's beautiful. It's lovely voice singing. There's one more example from Scrabbin I wanted to talk about today. Um, and this is maybe his, the best example I could come up with for um, influences in jazz from Scrabbin. And this is the opening to his sonata number four, which has a special place in my heart because I did it for my junior recital at Rice. And if I were just to play the first few bars for you, and you weren't Scrabbin enthusiast, as, as I know you are, you might not know really whether it was a jazz piece or a classical piece. That's actually something that happened to me here. Um, a very experienced jazz guitarist and I were kind of um, uh, in music room together, and I was just kind of fumbling around on, on the piano, and I started to play the opening of that. He's like, oh, what is that? And he thought it was a jazz standard because of the voicings, but but it's not. It's on his sonata number four it's by Scrabbin. the idea. Now, in the left hand, what's happening is Scrabbin is writing in what in jazz we would call rootless voicings. Oftentimes, when jazz students are learning, they learn to play rootless voicings, which means they play, you know, 2 five, one type of stuff, but without um, the root because the bass player plays the roots. So if I wanted to play a 2 five, one to F sharp major, I'd do this. That's a basic 2 five, one the left hand plays the root, and the right hand plays the third note voicing right here. There's alterations to that. I can do upper alteration like this. That's really what Scrabbin is doing. He's playing rootless voicings, but it sounds really ethereal and kind of otherworldly because there is no root. There is no bass player playing the root. If I was to flush it out and play the roots as, as a jazz bass player might, and just kind of play the harmonic progression of this, you would understand the jazz context a little bit more. Having a progression like that, knowing what the roots are, means that improvising over it is pretty direct. Now, probably, if I was going to have a progression like this, that's so lovely, 
I might not do it with quicker notes, I might do it in a more ballady context. lovely, otherworldly, but lovely. So that concludes the examples from Scriabin. But before we finish up today, I want to do the reverse. I want to take a well-known jazz standard and improvise it in the style of Scriabin. Now it's a little more difficult to do than the reverse because um, Scriabin was a magnificent composer and he was so thoughtful about his voice leading, about his inner harmonies, about left hand uh, motives and rhythmic, rhythmic motifs like uh, <laughs> You know, triplet and, and dotted rhythms and all, all, sort, all sorts of things. And it's really hard to capture uh, the essence of a composition in our improvisation. But I'll do my best to use some of his harmonies, some of his textures, some of his melodic approaches to come across as something that approximates what he might have done with a tune like this. The tune is called Someone to Watch Over Me. It was written by George Gershwin in 1926, only around a decade after Scrabin's death. Um... And b before I play it in a Scriabin-ified fashion, I'll show you what, what it sounds like uh, normally in a jazz context. <laughs> That's kind of a basic stride version of how someone might play that. And now I'm going to try Scriabinifying the tune. And see if you can spot some of the familiar textures.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and my best attempt at a scrabinified improvisation of a Gershwin tune. Thank you so much, and I'll be around afterwards to take your questions.